problem. Thank you all for coming here. Thanks to Macaulay Honors for hosting this event. Uh, Samantha, I'm delighted to be here with you again. Uh, we are going to read you a very short passage before we start our conversation with Robin. Uh, it's portion 23. Today I'm like in another planet. I'm finishing all the novel. That's the problem. That's a big issue. All of it. El cabello me crecía a capricho. First I'll read in Spanish, then Samantha will read for you in English. El cabello me crecía a capricho. Las uñas se alargaban. Las de los dedos de los pies, en lugar de tornar a cubrirlos como habían hecho las primeras pezuñas de materia tan similar, sobresalían y rasgaban. Una noche que Adán y yo dormíamos juntos y profundo, con la uña de mi dedo gordo le rasgué un orificio un poco más abajo de donde termina su espalda. El dolor del raje lo despertó. Por la hendidura salió su bagazo, lo que su cuerpo no tenía dónde guardar, y de inmediato Adán sintió un alivio. Ese movimiento involuntario marcó el inicio de una nueva etapa. La rotura incidió en su apetito. Ya no solo sintió sed, sintió hambre. A mí el accidente me enseñó que había en él una sabiduría mayor y que así fuera indomable, no era idiota. Estaba dotado de una sabiduría que no solo le concernía a sí mismo, también me alertó más a lo que le pasaba. Las uñas de mis manos me auxiliaban en todo. Eran, ahora no puedo decir, mis eficaces herramientas. Con la de un dedo gordo, lo escarbé más abajo de donde acaba mi columna y ahí hice también una rajadura para mí y salió lo que mi cuerpo deseaba desechar y sentí el placer que había sentido Adán y el hambre. Inspirada por mis uñas, hallé en las primeras escamas de piedra ya más, ya más, ya más las nuestras primeras herramientas. Las tallé y guardé cuidado y también tallé a modo mis uñas y peiné y adorné con plumas mi cabello. So, in English, these chapters have titles, and the title of this chapter is Fingernails, Hair, One Anus, The Other, Defecation, and Hunger. And the only thing you need to know is that when Adam and Eve come out of Eden, they have hooves, like horses, which gradually fall off as they come down the mountain from Eden. Also, you need to know that they are a bit like Ken and Barbie. <laughs> I mean, they have no orifices any place, if that's the word in English. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My hair grew capriciously. My fingernails grew long. The ones on my toes began to stick out and became sharp instead of growing over my feet like our hooves had, though they were a similar material. One night, when Adam and I were sleeping soundly together, I poked a hole at the base of his spine with my thumbnail. The pain of the tear woke him up. A kind of pulp came out of the crack, what his body didn't need, and immediately, Adam felt relieved. This involuntary act marked the beginning of a new era. The tear had an effect on his appetite. He no longer felt only thirst, but also hunger. The accident showed me that he had a certain wisdom and that for all his wildness, he was not an idiot. He was gifted with knowledge that extended beyond himself. It also showed me to be more attentive to what was happening. My fingernails helped me to do everything. They were, I can now say, my most useful tools. I used my thumbnail to make a tear at the base of my own spine, releasing everything my body didn't want, and I felt the same relief Adam had experienced, and hunger. Inspired by my fingernails, 
I carved the two slates into our first tools. I carved them, put them away, and looked after them. And I even filed my fingernails and combed my hair, decorating it with feathers. So thank you both for that. And that gives you just a little bit of the flavor of the book. And uh, if you haven't read it, uh, which you really should, and by the way, copies available for purchase after <laughs> the show, and uh, also for signature by our author, is the book is a retelling of the Adam and Eve myth. And it's, it's a very radical retelling in, in many interesting ways, which I hope we will explore some of them tonight. But also what's interesting about the book, at least to me, is that it's also a story about storytelling. So there's a lot of the way in which the story unfolds is really interesting. So it's not, it's not as if you just open the book and it's like, oh, Adam and Eve do all this sort of stuff. There are, there's framing devices. There's the way in which the story is told. There are the way it's broken up. There's conflicting stories. So there's really interesting, I think, things going on about storytelling. But where I'd like to start is at the beginning. So if the book begins, first of all, with a little disclaimer that says these are the private papers of Eve. But then the prologue is actually by Teresa of Avila, and it's basically saying all of this stuff is wrong and bad that you're going to read. And it's, it, it goes on in this way. And in fact, it's very um, visceral, like literally visceral in the way that it talks about this, the, the depravity of the work that you're about to read. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit, Carmen, about why begin in this way with this particular person, also a woman, right? So you hear you have a woman speaking out against this retelling of a story that's empowering of women. So could you talk a little bit about that? I found it so interesting. Yes, um, well, uh, first, I do have to say I adore Saint Teresa de Avila, Santa Teresa de Avila, as an author and as a person. I have deep I mean, admiration for her. I admire her poetry that is always like dismissed. I admire her prose and I admire her uh, stamina, to say so. I love her. Um, but she wouldn't ever like this version of Eve. <laughs> she was deeply religious. Her grandfather, uh, which came from a Jewish family, they had renounced to their Judaism. They had been accused of hiding their real um, profession of faith. Uh, the grandfather was humiliated publicly and accused of uh, being uh, a traitor to the church. And even her father, father in the second round, when he was 11 years old, he was, uh, he had to walk in the streets with, you know, the cone, the San Benito, humiliated by all the town. So for her, it was very important to prove she was totally kosher, excuse my expression. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, I admire her, I have to say that. And I have read her on numerable amount of pages, times, all her, all her work. And what I did is a palimpsesto. I stole her phrases mm. of uh, different passages of her work from the way we should all pray, from her way she tells how the circumstances in a, show, in a letter. So I, I, I gathered phrases of dislike that really came from her breast. And originally when I, first I was only obsessed by if I wanted to understand why it's like, it's like she is in, in the Bible. Uh, and then when I thought, well, what if I write something? I said, well, what if I let if women writers tell the story? and they passed the papers. So I, in fact, wrote several of the women writers' opinions and how they dealt with it. Some liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, I liked it. My brother Sargas liked it. It's, many of them liked them. Uh, and then others didn't much, especially St. Teresa. But that didn't work as a book, and it ended mm -hmm. being very repetitive. And then I heard it talk, and I Okay. And it was really like after, as it happens when one writes a novel, one digs and looks for and fights 
and then suddenly everything is alive and lost its own life. So she was already speaking, sometimes going too far, I tried to contain her, but she didn't let me do it. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, I, I then returned, I sometimes returned to my former manuscript, and I couldn't get rid of Teresa. Why? Because I love her, even though she didn't like my Eve. So I left her as a kind of preface of the book. It's not in the core of the book. It's, let's say, it's prehistory. But I couldn't avoid leaving it there. I, I, I needed it. And I wonder what uh, St. Teresa thinks of it. I think she then laughs because she had a lot of sense of humor. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. I, I was also thinking, well, there's, if there's any way to defeat criticism of your novel is to put the critic in the front, <laughs> saying, this is terrible stuff. And if you get past that and you read the book, then what else could a critic say? That would be the first thing. Someone you're putting in the, yourself. Oh, that's really interesting. So, Samantha, I want to ask, I'd like to ask you a question about the translating work. So, you know, the Adam and Eve story is such a foundational story. And, you know, I grew up Protestant, not a real big church guy, but of course I know the story. Of course I know how it goes. And I've sat in many pews where this has been told to me over and over again. And so, given that this is such a foundational story, and, and also, it's also a story that almost all of us, in fact all of us, I would say, encounter in translation. Like it is already a translation, and sometimes a translation of a translation. And so did, did this story give you any particular or unusual challenges in translating, but also translating the story itself? And did you, like, did you go back to different versions of the story that you knew yourself in working on Carmen's book? Yeah, so, um Starting, you know, the register of the preface by St. Teresa is obviously very different from the register of the narration by Eve. And that was quite challenging. I knew it was a palimpsest, but I can't go to Carmen as a translator and say, tell me all of the lines that you have stolen from St. <laughs> Teresa and worked into this text. I also can't go and read all of St. Teresa and try to find them, or be, yeah. So, um, you know, I had, and there's actually not that much that has been translated into English. There's the Pangolin collection. Um, so I read a little bit of that, but then encouraged by Carmen, I just kind of like went off on my own way to translate in that particular voice of St. Teresa, this indignant voice. She's so angry about this, it's a, like a heretical text. And then, um, you know, I think the book moves on to talk about how Adam and Eve come out of Eden. And, and as we were talking about before, Robin, there's this very um, kind of, Eden is dead. It's totally boring. It's bland. There's nothing inspiring about it at all. And they come out of Eden, and it's they're in this totally sci-fi environment like you've never imagined before they're in the top of the mountain they've got these booths there is a lava lake there's a volcano you know and so you know it came totally from your imagination and and i didn't have a lot of points of reference or like images to be able to um, translate so that was almost like translating science fiction where i had it was something that's completely made up and there isn't a historical text that I found that was helpful to me. Um, later, as the story moves on and we kind of becomes a retelling of all of the tales that we know, Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel, those are stories where I could go back to my different, my three different versions of the Bible that was interesting to consult and see, like in the international version of the Bible, how does the language get used? And, and as you said, these are all translations from Aramaic or Hebrew. Um, so that was very interesting to me, just as a thought experiment, to go back and look at the different versions of the Bible. 
And it reminded me of a time when I was in a, a religion class, and this is a very long time ago, so I don't remember all of the text, but I do remember clearly we started with the Epic of Gilgamesh, and we went all the way through the New Testament. We read the Gathas of Zarathustra, and I remember being absolutely dumbfounded when we read the Gathas of Zarathustra that you could see in, in that text the kernel of the, the Bible, of the first five books of the Bible, and that you read the Quran after that, and, and you see, again, like the Jesus, Mary, and Joseph story. So it becomes so clear when you do that thought experiment how this is a mythology that's been handed down from generation to generation to generation, and it's been tweaked along the way by different prophets but, but you know, ultimately, it's all coming from the same source, these Zoroastrians who worshiped fire in what we call now Iran. So um, you know, for me, this book is very much, it's like just another iteration of this myth telling that you know, some people call religion, and I, I, you know, I respect that. People should be able to believe whatever they want to believe. Um, and you know, my belief is that it is, it's a, it's a mythology, that, that's our mythology, and um, that's why it was so exciting to work on this book, because, you know, for me as, as a girl, I, at going to church, and my grandfather was a Protestant minister, sitting in a church and, and listening to these stories, which are quite misogynist, you know, I, I just, I couldn't really wrap my head around that, and then, going to Catholic school where, where girls couldn't serve behind the altar, only boys could when I was that age. Um, you know, it's sort of like a, a long simmering resentment within me about the, the real bias against women. And I think it's like better to set the record straight than never, that, you know, and that's very much what he was doing. And I think that's what you set out to do with the book, no? Yes, I mean, evidently I, I did. Uh, I, it's very peculiar because I grew up in an extremely Catholic family. Sorry, Robin, I didn't want you to add anything. Of course I want you to add. Well, I mean, uh, it's your book. No, but well, it's not that it's your table. <laughs> uh, um, I, 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 I didn't say it was not for me an agenda. But it was for me a surprise when I, I mean, I, I lived all my childhood relief in my family where they were so Catholics that we were a missionary family. <laughs> uh, and uh, I went to mass daily in the morning during years before class. So there was a very, very religious, uh, they, they were very honest in their beliefs. And the uh, Eve was just part of the lot. It was not something that really obsessed me. Other things being, like why women couldn't be priests, or why couldn't I be a priest, which was something I wanted to be for a moment when I was a little kid, and they explained me who because I, I was a girl. And I said, well, no problem. I'll be a man when I'm old. It was like <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't understand. So it wasn't that, um, that in that sense, that fears. Uh, but it, it, it suddenly, I momentarily, I was looking at one of these goddesses in the Templo Mayor, the beautiful Latecutli there, lying down, you know, these ancient Nahuas goddesses, with all her fears, body half animal and half uh, human, half eating bird and half, it, half eating the, the Tlatuani, the king, she's eating the blood of him and all of us. And I was looking at that fierce image and I said, how strange is Eve? So I went back to talking about Eve and to my surprise, the previous versions of Eve, uh, she was different. So yes, that retelling of Eve kind of surprised me. And I, in the Robert Graves book, I went into all the footnotes and looking for the sources and reading them with passion. But between that and writing a novel, there was an abyss. And evidently, well, I'm a woman of the century, evidently the wave of new feminism 
uh, was entering through my window and in my base. And evidently, when I went with them on the march in the marches in Mexico City, I remember the ones of the late 70s and early 80s when we were 10, or sometimes they were eight, and I didn't even go. And now it was all this roar of women. Uh, so I, I think it affected me, but it's not like I said, oh, I'm going to tell a feminist. It, it, I think have like the like the goal because writing is something very complex and, and has to do with our own deepest demons and our deepest understanding of the world and our de deepest not understanding of everything. So I, I, I finally ended writing it without an agenda. But the agenda I think is everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th that's, that's really interesting because one thing I wanted to follow up on it and dig into a little deeper is that, I don't know, again, if you have not read the book, there, it's, it's a very radical retelling, and it's radical in many different ways. So you, there are many different ways to, to retell the myth. For example, you could have said, uh, you know, Adam was the one who actually ate the apple, and he's the one responsible for everything that follows, right? That's a little retelling. It's a, like a slight change that has somewhat of an agenda difference. So you can't blame Eve for everything, but everything's, you know, you can't blame Eve for everything the way it is. But the retelling that Carmen does is quite radical in that the heaven that they exist in is, is almost an abstraction. So in fact, she calls it at one point an abstract plaything. So there's no color, there's no sound, there's no flavor, there's no, so we have this, the story as it's been handed down is this lush paradise where we are living these, you know, or Adam and Eve are living these luscious, wonderful, sensual lives. You imagine a garden, right, full of the fruits and all that. And then they're kicked out and it's all rocks and pain and childbirth and all that and death. But the story that you tell is in fact flipped, where there is emptiness, abstractness, no pleasure, no feeling, no sensation, no color, no words, no language. There's, it's, it really is like an abstraction. And being kicked out, suddenly they're kicked out into sensuousness. They're kicked out into their bodies. So the, the knowledge that they receive, that she receives in inviting the apple is really a knowledge of her own body as a sensual thing. And so that's a really radical idea and then what follows from all that. And then there's, you know, it's, Carmen also, by the way, is kicking over all sorts of, <laughs> all sorts of myths along the way. There's a great thing about penis envy, which I will let you get to and enjoy when you get there. But so, so I'm curious about how you kind of roll downhill into that. Because what I'm asking is like, there are many different ways to retell it. So Eve could have been proud to have taken the apple. She could have, said, no, it was Adam the retelling. So why, how did you get, how did you find yourself at this retelling? Especially, I'm, I'm so curious about heaven prior to the fall. That is so unexpected to me when I read it. That was really dramatic. Well, as a semi-reader of the book, I can explain. But as a writer of the book, uh, I saw it like that. Mm. But as a semi-reader of the book, I understand it as they come from the Eden that happens to be all under control of the divinity, but without any conscience of it. And where's earth? I mean, there's nothing better than earth. So I imagined it like a kind of desolated moon or planet where there's no life, something even worse if there's no time, there's no darkness, there's no light, there's no, it's abstract in fact. And there's no, the perception of the human, and there's no real bodies. So I imagined that place, and it was very unattractive, <laughs> when Earth, oh wow, Earth is something. And now as a semi-reader of the book, I think, well, in this Western tradition of the Eden and us being taught to Earth because of 
teeth. Uh, I barely, I mean, I see clearly why us, the Westerners, and I'm Mexican, but I'm kind of Westerner, um, why do we treat there? We have treated there as we do, because suddenly we arrive to a foreign horrible place, and we start throwing our trash into it, because it's trash. It's like being in a dump. So all this strange relationship with the earth that calls my attention, but that really has to do with our culture, because there's no biggest privilege than living on earth. It is so beautiful, the skies, the winds, the trees, the, the, the sea, the, everything is beautiful, or used to be beautiful before we destroyed it. So I, 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 I read that as a semi-reader, as I say. How did I fail there? Well, I think that the work of a writer, yes, I'm totally responsible for it, but I'm totally only a thermometer of what's happening. And not that I am doing this voluntarily saying, where does the wind blow? Let me write where the wind blows. It's like we really write, well, because we write with language. And language is not mine, nor yours, nor yours. Language is always done by one of us. So the, the writer works with a material that is communitary. We, we writing, we entangle with the others. It's true that we do it alone in our homes, isolated hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. It's true that, and it's true that the rest of the world is feeding and we are there apart, but we are also speaking with language. And, and, yes, language, the present, what's floating, the, 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 the atmosphere that's around us, but also the immense capital of the former writers. Because a writer doesn't write alone either. Writes with all those authors that one reads, and one continues reading, because one has to be an avid reader as a writer. And that may cause have a tone. Because we don't we we don't write with our own it's not true that we write with our own tools that we do alone. We write with you, we write with others. And that is something uh, very extraordinary. And I think of my arrogance when I was a young, young writer and I thought that I was illuminated and alone. I felt like St. Teresa, but of a big church. I felt it was like, oh, I'm a writer. And, and then I realized that, oh, oh, you are here. Life is here, and we are a mystery because yes, we are born, but yes, we are going to die. And and all that, and how do we interpret our own existence? And it, it's such a big uh, miracle, and it's not a private miracle. It's not something that happens. Yes, I am important, and everybody is very important. Every life is something that cannot be replaced every person, but I don't do it alone. No writer does it alone. We do it. And that is something in the writing. So I think that also if I caught, but not this way, but because it was felt the feminist thing, I also caught the, 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 the need of really having an ecological conscience and understanding that for my grandkids, there won't be water to drink, there won't be a planet to live at, because there's been a tradition and a, and a, and a conviction that we are Edenites, we are Edenites, and that we give she so us here. And this is not here, this is not a big home, this is life. So more or less as a reader, but as a writer, I explain my thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly so. And and by the way, speaking of words, in the book, you, I will let you guess who does as much naming of things as Adam. So um, also it reminded me of Thoreau who talked about writing as, as being, you need to be born again to be a writer. So we, we learn, as he says, the mother tongue at the foot of our mothers, but we must be born again in order to speak writing. It's another kind of journey. Yes, it's something 
something so peculiar because we are learned to talk. Well, we normally all, most of us human beings, we just learn to talk without studying. Mm -hmm. uh, but writing? It's hard. It's <laughs> hard. Yeah, I mean, Thoreau calls it the father tongue, but we'll forgive him for that. Uh, <laughs> fair enough, he probably shouldn't be forgiven for many things. Um, so, Samantha, the, I'll ask you a question. So, you've You've collaborated with Carmen on lots of works, multiple works now. So has your relationship to her writing and to Carmen has, and to translation, have those changed over your collaboration with her? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, in the beginning, when you're translating someone, it's a little bit like dating, you know? Like, you have to figure out if you have chemistry or not. And um, I knew, for, for me as, as the translator, I knew that I would have chemistry with you because <clears throat> your text, the first text I translated was from a novel called La Trama Nure de Paco. And I loved it. It's a kind of uh, Cervantian story about a character who's actually a character of Cervantes. However, she's female and she goes through a sort of similar journey of adventures to Don Quixote. So I thought this is fantastic and and for Carmen it's the other way around she has no idea who I am she doesn't know what my aesthetics are what my interests are so she had to read it and then she gave it to her other reader Mike and I remember you told me I think they, <laughs> I'm meeting my husband <laughs> you liked it and then you, Mike Mike gave it the seal of approval Mike said Yes, it's it's sounds like you. So um, that was the beginning of our journey, and that was in 2006. So we've been working on a lot of different things since then: book reviews, essays, a screenplay, poetry, novels. So you know, Carmen is a very prolific writer, and only a fraction of what she's written is available in English. So. Um, I keep trying to like find ways to bring more of her books into the English language, which as a translator, you have to be quite creative and see where you can get funding for translations, because that's a big problem in the United States. And, you know, over the years, I think it evolved into more of like a friendship in the sense that when we were working on Texas, you came over to my apartment and we worked in my apartment. And this past weekend after the Brooklyn Book Fair, I went over. Carmen's apartment, and we worked on complot. So, you know, it's like a, I don't know, I mean, like, you could say, like, a sisterhood, or, you know, like, a, a kind of intimacy that you wouldn't really have with a lot of people, and, and that's very precious. I call it friendship. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's so interesting that, did it sound like her? Like, that's the question like the, the important question, did it sound like Carmen? Well, and, and what we were doing on Sunday night until after midnight, after which Carmen kicked me out, and she said, I need to go and work on my lecture now. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, what we were doing is working on the first chapter of a, a novel that I'm in the process of translating. And really, the first chapter is the most important because you need to know that you have the voice correct and I need to know that Carmen is happy with the voice as it sounds in English, because as you can see, she's perfectly fluent in English. So I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't want to, um, you know, cast the wrong register. So that was, and now I can kind of take that ball and run with it to all the way to the end of the book, because um, that one has a very distinctive voice that stays quite consistent throughout the book. And by the way, I, I want to add also, you know, having spent time in, in Carmen's house, there's like, I don't think there's a minute of the day when you're not either creating something or thinking about creating something. You go to her house for dinner, and not only did she make the dinner, but she made the tablecloth that the dinner is on. You know, like everything, the walls are decorated with her art, like it's a very, um, that to me, that's what God is. Like I think of if, if there's a God, 
creature, entity, that's a creative, essentially a very creative entity who's, mm -hmm. who's got an impulse to create something out of nothing. And that's why I think you're the perfect author for this book, because it's, you know, like that, that godlike quality. And, and I will say, maybe people think it's like, oh, this story's been around for thousands of years. It hasn't done anyone any harm. It's not that big a deal. I just want to remind everyone that Pope Francis called a synod or synod or however you pronounce it to debate, they just did it last week, to debate whether or not priests should continue to be celibate. Of course, the option could be you have millions of celibate nuns. So if you think it's important to be celibate, to be a person of the cloth, you could go that direction and you could have the nuns serve as the priests, like you were saying. But no, the question they will debate is whether or not the men should continue to be celibate. So I see this text as extremely relevant to our world today. Yes, and Pope Francis is being called a radical for even having this suggestion. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to open it up for the audience here, but I, I'm the moderator, so I get to say one more thing. Um, and that, what struck me, and this is not really a question, although I would happily, if you guys want to comment on it, but what struck me in reading this book is that, is that myths, so foundational myths like the Adam and Eve myth are themselves like paradises in which we inhabit because they, they're explanations, right? Myths are explanations. They just kind of take care of the thinking for you. And so in reading this book, if you, you can get the sense of being, of experiencing the fall yourself in a sense of you, you have this myth, you kind of know how it goes, it's very comfortable, you know kind of where you know, everybody gets back. I was telling my son this, you know, my head kids never been to church. But, you know, oh yeah, there's this myth, and then you have to get baptized because you're inheriting the sin from, from Eve, essentially. And so to, to get kicked out of that myth, right, that explains so much. And then to have something like this, and suddenly you are kicked out, you are faced with a different reality. You have gained a knowledge that maybe you don't know what to do with. And so uh, that was one of the things I really appreciated this book, is it kind of sent me on the Adam and Eve journey uh, in reading. So again, not a question, just an observation I had. You wanna, anybody have questions in the audience? Ask either one of our. I'm sure, maybe you want to do the honors, but I'll start um, This is a question about the reception of the book thus far. Uh, I think we can all agree that some people don't like their myths being messed with, <laughs> uh, and that there have been some rather severe consequences for people uh, for that. So, if you could talk a, a little bit, you know, about to what degree you were aware of the fact that you're engaging in this kind of enterprise, challenging some things that people never wish to have uh, ch challenged, and then uh, has anything, as it were, happened on the ground, whether that be reviews of a certain kind or, you know, a, a reading that was a little less receptive than this, than this particular hall is. Uh, I really like that question. Um, well, when I was writing it, I was not thinking about the reception. I have my own battles with the text to think about the other battles later. Um, but I was surprised. El País always is very positive in its reviews of my books, but they killed me. And it was so interesting, the review, because their reviewer evidently hadn't finished reading the book. And the reviewer had two books that she was talking about at the same time. And the first one, she talked on and on and on. And at the end, she said, as for the book of it, don't read it. It's bad. And he, that's not the way you review a book, or not a book of Carmen Bogiosa, sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I immediately then understood and said, irritated her. And maybe it 
dictated her when I started with our divine Saint Teresa. She's a saint. She's a patron of Spain. Um, and, uh, and I think that was it. And then also the gender thing, because they, yes, they're sad and they're sick, they are a couple, but when they come out, they are sexless. And they make their own love, they make their own, they take their own identities, they take, so I know I was punished. And how did I felt about it? Enraged, two hours. <laughs> then, like half an hour sad, and then I forgot the love that you ask. <laughs> <laughs> While writing a book, it took me a lot of time, years, to write a book. Uh, so the reaction in reality wasn't that big compared to the to the fact because I didn't I didn't think of what you were saying. Now, yes, it was that. I have no doubt. What can I do? <laughs> Let's go to mass together. I should have brought with me for a lesson, but I didn't. <laughs> But I think also, you know, I, I live in Texas, and we leave the country, and well, I think Florida might have outpaced us on book bans, but it's pretty close. And, um, you know, if this book had gotten into the hands of one of the fundamentalist uh, evangelical types, you know, at least in Christianity, they don't have fatwas, which, you know, that's a serious issue. Um, and I did, when I was translating, I thought, you know, this, if it got into the hands of like a really fundamentalist crazy person could really be a problem. I mean, they'd say no such, there's no such thing as bad publicity, but no one wants to deal with that kind of, uh, that, that brand of craziness. So it's a good thing, I think, that um, it didn't have that kind of, of reception. I mean, I think to start, Probably the cover is off-putting to many uh, <laughs> people of that ilk. But you know, I can see. I didn't. The woman who reviewed it in El País, you know, there's so many subtle things that, for example, when we were talking about Eden, it occurred to me, Eden, it, it's like you reversed it. Eden is like limbo. It's colorless, gray, you know, and, and limbo being where you go in the Catholic religion after died but you haven't been redeemed because the Savior has not come to cleanse every one of their sins yet. So you just go into this holding tank for half of eternity until the Savior returns. And that's what I imagine when I, I learned about limbo in Catholic school, like that's exactly what limbo sounds like. So you did a lot of little Tur yeah, turning things on their head, which I can imagine for people who had learned like this is the way it is, that could be really disruptive to their worldview. Sure, we're aiming towards the the afterlife is the place to aim towards. Where in this book, life is good. This life yeah. is good. So when I was reading the book, I was really surprised by the form that God took, whereas like, he's sort of just like this shapeless noise that like, and Eve almost seems like not respectful of him or like treats uh, treats thunder as this like just this thing that exists sort of matter of factly. Uh, what inspired this uh, like form of God that? Uh, yeah, I, look, what inspired it, I was really surprised to see it because I feel like I've, I've never seen uh, like God depicted in this way. Um, very good question. I am not sure I can answer completely correctly, but I imagine that that uh, character of the novel was shaped that way because I was fascinated by the former myths of Eve, religious myth, I mean the former versions, pretty extraordinary, where she was totally different and the action is different and everything is different, very different. So much so that how could you disappear those former wonderful versions if it wasn't 
through shouting to loud. So I think that's why I went for the thunder image. Because there had to, something terrible, I mean, something very noisy had to happen to opaque and disappear the very rich former versions of that very first woman or the first women, and there are several ones, that are even narratively very attractive, much more attractive than the one we have in the traditional Eve of our tradition. Uh, full of little twists and richness and humor and, and wings and things happening that are fascinating. So a thunder had to happen. And my thunder, for the reason why it got so inspired, is what in the Catholic tradition, what the final version of we read of the Genesis was approved was in the Council of Trento. And the Council of Trento images that I prepared and the texts, and they are more readable for me, I see those images of all those uh, men uh, with skirts, sorry for the lack of respect, but with this kind of covering their legs, all reddish and white or black, and all of them, and in the, in the, in the vision, in the physical visual, how they are represented, they are all silent and just like listening. But I'm sure that the Council of Trento was not there. And I have animated those images many times in my head. And I hear them shouting and discussing, particularly the theme of Eve. And I imagine when the Esther in the Bible appeared, how much they shouted too. But the thunder didn't win there. Esther is very different. But many others, I mean, I, I imagine the discussions of how are we going to do like a few texts in the middle of the Lutheran revolution and the rest. I imagine, and I imagine the, the loud, and I think that thunder changed, shaped finally the if I read. I know this is not historically precise because it had been read already like that, and because also in the other Bibles of the other Christian mm -hmm. beliefs, I, 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 she's there, it's the same, but that's what I, that's how I think. I, as you use the word inspiration, I reject the word inspiration. Uh, because I think that mainly when one writes, one doesn't write inspired. One writes inspiring. <laughs> it is really so much, and uh, the, the inspiration implies that maybe you are like kind of old and just do what you do, and it's not like that. <laughs> Lots of sweat of uh, many types, and it's just something so uh, active. So, um, but that's how I think I got it. on this a little bit with your, with your discussion about translation. And I was just wondering, like, what happens when there's a disagreement? Do you ever bicker? Who wins out? And also, um, how, I guess I want to just hear a little bit more, like, how different it is from translating somebody who doesn't speak English. Like, they generally have to go by what you say, and they might not even understand hardly at all what, what you're writing. We don't really bicker. I mean, if, Car yeah, if Carmen says, I'm not sure about that, then I will find another solution. And there's always another solution. You know, language is so flexible. So, um, you know, that could be over a certain word or it could be something kind of bigger picture. Um, working with a writer who doesn't have a solid command of English is a little bit trickier because you know they really are they're putting their faith in you but you can like i can still communicate with the author in spanish and say like this word has such and such nuance and this word doesn't and which do you prefer um, but you know for me that's part of the joy of the process of translation the the spanish writer javier marias who just passed away recently 
had um, said on a number of occasions that for him translation was like an apprenticeship in writing and that he translated Tristram Shandy, you know, as, as a kind of exercise in learning English. And it's interesting because if you read his novels, he also kind of has that very long winded style. Um, so, you know, for me as a, I think of translation as writing, but it's a different kind of writing, whereas rather than making it up completely from my own head, which is what I did in graduate school, I'm, I'm following a map. And Carmen has given me a very, very beautiful map. And I'm going to follow, but I don't have to take the exact path. I can, there are many different pathways to get there. Uh, there are authors like uh, translators who say, I would much prefer to work with dead authors. Um, Michael Hoffman, who translates from German, you know, has said that publicly. Um, and for me, that would be like my worst nightmare. You know, I'm translating Saint Teresa, oh, perish the thought, you know. <laughs> so it's just a, it's an individual kind of I think preference for a translator. Uh, has uh, writing this book changed your view about religion? Oh, I love that uh, question. In a very peculiar way, I would say that even in an opposite side, um, my family very, very Catholic, and I needed to take a distance to build my person. Besides, my mother had died, I had a horrible stepmother, many things that I really needed to rebuild myself. And that implied also like not wanting to hear anything about religious things. And here I thought of so many, let's say that I kind of went again to mass many times while writing the book. And we're reading other passages of the Bible. And also, uh, though it's, it, I don't think it might be the language of the novel, not the plot. But I was very much, uh, like when writing poems, very much in contact with something that is so inexplicable, inexplicable, that put me in a, in a, in a I wouldn't say religious mood, but in something like, and since after, even after publishing the book, I have returned to that it has to do with the conscience of being a human, and it's kind of a religious experience. It's so peculiar because it's not in the book, but it was in me returning and rethinking, and also returning at the, I said it already, I'm sorry I repeated, but the mystery of being alive. Mm -hmm. and I know that writing always puts souls here like that, but sometimes less, and sometimes more. And this book put me, made me kneel in many ways. I don't know if I'm being clear to you. It didn't, it didn't make me be less religious. Uh, in fact, I am like a kind of, uh, through all my adulthood, I'm a kind of anti-religious person. But the book put me in a, I don't know how to explain it. And I'm like also like listening to the dead and put me in a very peculiar mood of which I haven't gotten rid of yet. Um, something very inexplicable when to the word already. I am so sorry, that, that, that helps me like mute. But uh, that muteness grew while writing a very peculiar way, especially if you hear that I turn God into a, a, a zombie. So, but it was like part of all this because there's no way to to really ever understand what the, what this story of being was here is about. I have not read the book, but I, you said that you were 
battling certain things and you are not wondering about the reception. But I wanted to know who do you have in mind when you write? And the second question is, when you translate some, do you know, do you need to know who the target audience is? So that you try to keep the tone that we got in mind. Uh, to answer your question, honestly, I'm terrible. I never think of the reader. <laughs> I don't think of the text very much. I'm obsessed about every aspect of it, the, the, the what they call the structure, the riddle, the wording, the tone, how to achieve the tone, which music I hear too, so that I get that into that audible mood, uh, and I do think that uh, uh, because it's not of language, so it has it, it has to be read, unless it doesn't work, because I have finished several novels, and not to speak of how many poems and plays, that I've never polished, because they don't work. Uh, and I know they don't work when I let it sit a bit, and then I go aside and go to the other side, I'm the reader, I say, good, 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 this is horrible, <laughs> and I don't publish it. I, I destroy it, or I just uh, leave it in my drawer, or uh, I don't publish it, or I, I don't, I reject it. Uh, but I never think, as I know other colleagues do, and good they do, because they have a good market reception, some of them, some don't, but they do think of uh, how do I hook the reader? How do I do this for the reader? I think that the, the literary text is like a body. And as a body, I won't do to my text what uh, uh, many human beings do to their aspect all the time going to surgeons, that they change themselves to look better. So I don't make them look better. I make them look what they are, that they go a lot to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> but not in terms of the market reception, but, no, but maybe it's different to keep yes, women, no, of, it's, of, it's very young women in mind as opposed to old males, or I don't know. No, no? I, I, do, I tell you, I have this horrible selfish me, or so many years of being a writer. Mm -hmm. I decided I was a writer when I was 15, I'm going to be 70 next year. So all these years, I've been a writer. It's true that I do other little things, but they are all related to it. And I live like a writer, and it's my own being a writer, and I, it's horrible, I'm selfish. <laughs> <laughs> so then the second question doesn't cost me, I guess. Well, it, it does, actually, because um, not so much for this book, but I do, as a translator, I, I do think about the receiving audience in as much as there are certain cultural um, content of, of specific texts that uh, uh, a source audience would be very familiar with and a target audience would have no, they would just go straight over their head and they would lose it. So when that happens, you can gloss it as a translator and you just add a few extra words to contextualize or kind of drop in a hint. Um, this is very difficult with Carmen's work because there's a lot of palimpsesting going on throughout all of her novels. And, you know, I think of one example that's a really good example of this is when we were working in Texas and the cowboys around the campfire, their Mexican cowboys have songs that they sing. They're singing corridos, which are full of cultural Mexican, specifically Mexican cultural references, which would be completely lost on any English language reader, except maybe like three people who live on the border and, and a part of Chicano culture. So um, in that case, you know, we had to replay it. It took forever to come up with a solution. We, we is a crowd. Samantha did it. <laughs> <laughs> but there are there are times like that where you have to say this isn't going to work in the in the target audience. So you know, what else can we do? Um, that would create a similar effect, that would create the same kind of appreciation in the target audience. Um, some translators are purists and would never do that, and would just say, too bad, so sad, target audience. 
you're never going to get it, you know, like you would need to have like a, a critical edition that would kind of explain all of that cultural backstory to you. Um, I, I prefer to have a book be as rich as it possibly can be. So if I'm working with an author who says, um, yes, you have my permission to kind of augment or, or change in a way that makes the reading as rich for the target audience reader as it was for the source audience reader, I, I would definitely do that. Let's, let's do these last two questions and we'll be done. Uh, Carmen already answered the part of the question that I had. I started reading the novel in, uh, in English, and then I noticed the, the musicality of it. And I said, oh, I have to read it in Spanish too at the same time. So I've been, <laughs> I've been reading both of them. I'm halfway. I haven't finished. <laughs> so I was very curious uh, to ask if, um, if when you are creating, when you are translating, if you read it out loud or if you have the music inside, and if this is also an aspect in which the two of you have uh, cooperated. You said before, that if there is um, two different words that have different nuances, which do you prefer? And if you also did uh, regarding the, the sound. I, I was absolutely fascinated. I said, if this is music, <laughs> this is a symphony, well, not a symphony, a sonata, because it's more um, concentrated. So that's my question, and you partially asked it, but I would like more details. Which I can write still. The proof is my poor little hand that is half rotten because I still hand write with my pen. And I read aloud everything. I start page one, I read it aloud, and then I add a little bit new on it to continue writing or to advance in the book. Um, and I do that because I, I, I need that fluid to say so. So I start, I read, I read, I read, I read, and now to myself. Mike says I talk all the time, it's true I talk all the time, and I also read all the time aloud. I don't read the others aloud, seldom I do. But I read all I write, I read, I read, I read, I read, I read, I read ceremoniously, and then I add. Or, in the novel I'm writing now, I start it all over again because I hear something is not right. Then I start all over. And I have we listening to Samantha uh, when we are working on, or she's working on the translation, and I am her like a subsidiary consultant, consultant <laughs> person. Um, she she sometimes says, "I want this word because it sounds," and I feel so happy. Because yes, sound is very important. Yeah, so, uh, you know, in Words Without Borders, this month we're going to publish an essay by the this year's International Booker Prize winner, Gergi Gospodinov. And in this essay, he says, When I think of a writer, I don't think of a hand with a pen, I don't think of a mouth talking, I think of an ear. Because writers have to listen to be able to write. Uh, you know, that's just one writer's perspective, but I think it's true. I mean, I, for me, the ear is the most important, and there is certainly a musicality to Carmen's prose that I think is important to try to, you can't, obviously different languages have different personalities. We don't have all of the beautiful vowel endings that Spanish or Romance languages have in English, but um, I think it is, it's very important to me, but it's not as much of a, a considered process as an instinctual process of like, you know, because there, you can't transpose it um, correctly, perfectly ever. So that's why they have that horrible cliche, you know, some things get lost in translation. Well, some things get found in translation too. So you can also, create different kinds of, like if you're translating poetry and there's a lot of rhyme, you can't do that in English as easily, maybe alliteration or you know other ways of, of creating that. Musicality is, I, th I think, a very important way of 
of doing translation, and I'm glad that you thought that the English was musical. I was really good. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, my question is more on the initial stages of like the book. Did you always see the story as a retelling of Eve? Like, did you consider other important female figures in the Bible, such as Sarah, um, Esther, or even Mary? Did it. Uh, I, I centered in Eve as much as I could, her as a complete person. Uh, and the fact is that when I finished it, I said, now I'm going to go to Mother. And I thought of Esther, but we didn't, we didn't have the tinge of that situation. We didn't, we didn't fall in love reciprocally. She didn't like me or something happened. <laughs> and I couldn't have that uh, relationship with her. Uh, but with Eve, the Eve that appeared, I had it and I tried to give her, but I stole, it's not Noah's Ark, it's hers. I stole a lot of things of her own story for her own person. Uh, and she steals the fire, not from a tale, she steals the fire. She's the one who brings it here. So more than biblical, it was like to give her what she demanded. And I didn't really say, well, I'm going to steal from this Greek and then put this with this here. No, it was like, it was obvious, it was she. And the, it's, she steals it from a sexy angel. So, it, yes, that's my favorite part of the book. So, yeah. so buy the book and, and read about the sexy angels and where she steals the fire. So please join me in thanking us.